Happy holidays. I am Gwendolyn Brashear, co-host of G3, Good Grief, Good Gossip, Good God. And I have the awesome pleasure of standing in for none other than the pre-worship experience queen herself, Miss Crystal. Tonight, we are taking a look back at some of our favorite SSC moments of 2021. First, we will share the candid interview Rev and First Lady Barnetta Cosby gave during the 42nd Pastoral Anniversary Special. After that, we'll revisit one of our most popular services of 2020, the 4th of July, where Rev Sermon, No Justice, No Peace, had us all shouting. We hope you enjoy this look back at some of our favorite SSC moments of 2021. We hope that they're your favorites as well. Kevin W. Cosby and Barnetta Cosby, God bless you. We're celebrating 42 years of ministry. Amen. Amen. Rev, tonight, tonight we are celebrating you and saluting you, you for all that you have poured into us in terms of teaching, for what you have done in terms of helping us to grow, stretching us, fighting for us on our behalf. Thank you for your impact on this community and on this world by the grace of God. Once again, let's give our pastor and first lady a hand of applause. God bless you tonight. So I have to say thank you, pastor, also. Thank you so much. I get emotional, so I'm just going to say thank you. But I thank you, Sister Barnetta Cosby, first lady Barnetta Cosby. You are an amazing woman. And I a an amazing woman. The strength that I see in you, it's not what you say, it's what I see. And I love you so, we love you so much because you are our sister and you are our friend and you are the mother of St. Stephen Church as pastor is the father of St. Stephen Church. And what all of us know is that whatever St. Stephen is, pastor could not have made it what it is without our first lady, Barnetta Cosby. Thank you for your service. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Now, it's time for us to get candid with the pastor and first lady. We have right down here at our side a container full of questions. And these are questions which have been uh, asked by those on campus and those online. They're questions that we, we've got the opportunity to, to randomly draw these. These have been randomly generated and we have just drawn, we're, we're going to draw a few of them and we're, we just just want to ask your, your heart's response on these. Can I start? This is the first question from somebody. They want to know, how do you stay passionate about the church and its people? Pastor, Sister Cosby. I don't even, I don't even think about it, really. Uh, I just try to be myself and be who God wants me to be. And... Um, as a result, it's just automatically, uh, if, you're, if you're doing what God has called you to do and you treat everybody the same, Amen. you love everybody, and it's, it's just a natural reflex. Amen. That's beautiful. Pastor, would you like to share? How do you stay passionate about <laughs> that's a That's a good question. I, I really never thought about it. Um, <laughs> I just know that um, you have to work while it's day for the night's coming when no one can work and um, there's some things with the limited time that I have that I want to see done in my lifetime and uh, so um, I give myself uh, wholeheartedly to that and um, Sometimes you see the immediate fruits, sometimes you don't. Um, but for my 42 years, and I'm sure Barnetta could attest to this, there has never 
been one dull moment. I mean, it's always, we're, we are always as a church getting ready for something big. And uh, so it's been exciting. And um, I think that it could not happen if I had not had a congregation that I was compatible with, who was not stuck in tradition, who wanted to push the boundaries, who had a Star Trek mentality, let's boldly go where no other church has gone before. Amen. So, um, yeah. Yeah, we are reflective of our leader though. Honest to God, we couldn't have done any of it without the push, the vision, the visionary pastor that you are. Yes, amen. Amen. Well, now we're going to, we're going to select another from our randomly selected group here. Now, ooh, now this is for either or both. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you have given your younger self 42 years ago? <laughs> Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your younger self of 42 years ago? <laughs> Probably worry less, risk more. Hmm. There's wisdom. That's wisdom right there. Amen. Yeah. 42 years ago, if I need, <laughs> I have to think about that. Um, um, I'd probably just say take one day at a time. Uh, just be yourself. Hmm. Just be yourself. Don't let anyone else uh, influence you one way or the other. Be who you know who you are, know who you are, and be true to yourself. Amen. That's great advice, Sister Cosby. Amen. Let me just, one more question. I think that we can. Hey, can, I, can I say something also? Yes. In, in reference to Barnetta. And um, when we first came, she almost left me. <laughs> really, no joke. She was, wanted to go home. Um, and, uh, I mean, that first year was... <laughs> it was rough. A lot of tears. A lot of tears. And uh, because it was a new experience for her, she was thrusted into a role um, in which she, um, um, certain things were expected. And uh, um, I'm thankful that she has she grew to become comfortable in the skin that she was in. She didn't have to be anyone else um, but who she was and who she is. And so. Amen. So beautiful, Pastor. So beautiful. Yes. Let me ask another question of you. Oh, it's not my question. It's someone else's question. They want to know, how did you get involved with Twitter? Why and how did that become your social media platform of choice? Oh, my son, Kevin Christopher, helped me with my first tweet. And I am uh, Twitter addicted. Uh, and uh, it's just it's such a wonderful platform uh, to communicate, get thoughts out. So I just, uh, it was my son, Kevin Christopher. All right. All right, we, we have time for or another. Here's, here's another question. Let's see here. Let's draw one. And this question is simply to name one of your most memorable moments in the last 42 years. So many. Uh, so many. <laughs> really. I can't think of one particular one because each phase of, of the 42 years, every, every, I mean, when, when the, I remember when the first, when the church first got its first electric typewriter. <laughs> that seems so simple now, but 42 years ago, that was major. Um, I remember when we 
first started getting staff because when we came 42 years ago there were no there were no associate ministers there were no uh, we just there were a lot of faithful deacons um, so personally we've had our we were married at the church um, our children were born <laughs> at the church um, there's uh, there's so many memorable moments there's, for me there isn't one particular one because every phase of, of the growth of the church, we grew uh, individually and collectively. And as a family, we grew with the church. So um, there isn't one particular memorable moment. They've all been memorable. And I've tried to capture that and, and keep those moments uh, through cards, through letters through I have all 42 years of them in her house <laughs> I have a story so um, and I pull them out and I, I remind myself of and I have obituaries and because those are memorable moments those are are persons that we became close to and and became part of our family we became part of their family so um, it's just been a memorable 42 years there isn't one thing that I personally can say that stood out um, because it's all been each day and, and each day it's been something different. <laughs> yeah, if you didn't like it this year, next year it's going to be different. <laughs> We're going to try something new. So uh, it's, it's been a wonderful experience, journey. It was, it's never been a dull moment. I mean, we've just... Every year, something monumental takes place, something novel takes place, something creative takes place, and God's hand is on it. It's been anointed. Um, it has just been a remarkable 42 years. And I know I've been here for 42 years, but it goes by so quickly. And... Um, I feel, as, I, I know I'm older, but I feel as, as energized now. In fact, I started at St. Stephen's. We started. I was not 21 yet. I was 20 years old. And now that I'm 63, I feel just as excited about the possibilities of St. Stephen Church 42 years later as I did when Jimmy Carter was president in 1979. Amen. Amen. Reverend King, can I just ask this one question? So I think it is such a lovely one. And it says that you two pour so much into us. What can we do to encourage you? I would, I, I would say that you already do it. Right. Every time I see each one of you, um, you do it. You're smiling, you're hugging, you're, we're greeting as much as we can, can do. Um, but cards, letters, um, phone calls, um, I'm praying for you. Um, and, the, and it's an ongoing thing. It's not just a special occasion like the anniversary. It's... Um, birthdays, anniversaries, uh, personal days that we have. Um, you've just always been so supportive. Uh, it's been a consistent um, flow throughout these 42 years. And um, I'm grateful. <laughs> I, yeah. And we're going to keep it up, too, because you guys are such great leaders. Amen. 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 Let's have a hand once again yes. for our pastor and first lady tonight. What a blessing. holidays. I am Gwendolyn Brashear, co-host of G3, Good Grief, Good Gossip, Good God. And I have the awesome pleasure of standing in for none other than the pre-worship experience queen herself, Miss Crystal. 
Tonight, we are taking a look back at some of our favorite SSC moments of 2021. After that, we'll revisit one of our most popular services of 2020, the 4th of July, where Rev Sermon, No Justice, No Peace, had us all shouting. We hope you enjoy this look back at some of our favorite SSC moments of 2021. We hope that they're your favorites as well. And please don't forget our New Year's Eve watch night service. Join us in person or online Friday, December the 31st. It's happening at 6 p.m. on the Harding County campus at 8 p.m at the Southern Indiana campus and 9.30 p.m. the pre-worship experience begins and at 10.30 p.m. it all happens at the Louisville campus. You can also join us on all of our social media sites and the eCampus starts at 9.30. So don't forget that. We wanna see your face in the place no matter where it is, online or actually in person. We cannot wait to share that night with you. You don't want to miss this blessing either because you know what? Our New Year's Eve watch night service will have great worship, magnificent music, and a few surprises. So thanks for joining us. Now let's look back at our service from the 4th of July, which is one of my favorites from the world-renowned author, the talented Miss Betty Baye. Sister Betty opened up this service with a reflection on Frederick Douglass. What to the slave is the 4th of July? Let's take a look. Frederick Douglass resisted his master's determination to break him through torture. End goal was to turn young Frederick into a docile Negro. But as a free man on July 5th, 1852, unbroken Douglass delivered a scathing descent from white America's July 4th festivities. In a keynote address to a largely white audience, Douglass said, I say it with the sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. The 4th July is yours, not mine. And so here in 2021, we sit and stand in a church or watching on Facebook or YouTube, mostly we descendants of slaves, feeling much the same way as Frederick Douglass. What does all this celebrating Independence Day have to do with us? Our people have served this country in every war from the revolutionary up through the Middle East. Our people picked the cotton and cooked the master's food and nursed the master's baby. Our people, over generations, we have petitioned and preached and prayed and tap danced and grinned and sang peacefully march and begged for a fair chance. And what have we received in return is to be lynched marginalized, redlined, incarcerated, impoverished, demonized, and robbed even of our potential to build intergenerational wealth. For all that our people have sacrificed, suffered, bled, and died in word, deeds, and laws, America has not loved us back. So this new Juneteenth federal holiday notwithstanding, where are we now, black people? We are facing a movement that aims to deny us the descendants of slaves upon whose back this country was built the simple right to vote. There's a movement to deny school children, including our own, to learn the truth about the Africans from whom we are descended. 
how they came to America in the first place and what really happened when they got here. Indeed, we have come over a way that with tears have been watered, treading our way through the blood of our slaughtered. We don't have to look far to locate the modern moral monsters who plot our right, our rot and our demise. They sit in Frankfurt, in governor's mansions, in Congress, in the Senate and on the courts. But what I want these moral monsters to know on this July 4th, 2021, is that we see you. We hear you. We know your evil ways. We saw your sad, desperate army storming the capital that our ancestors built. You modern moral monsters are no different than the ones that Frederick Douglass called out 169 years ago when Douglass said, your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. And yes, as Douglas also said, that while you celebrate, we mourn. Oh! 
my name is Gwendolyn Brashear, and on behalf of the entire St. Stephen family, the Louisville campus, Indiana, Hardin County, Dusker Manor, and the email campuses, we say welcome to St. Stephen Baptist Church Sunday morning service. We are so thankful for your presence here with us today. I know Pastor has a powerful word to be heard, so now is the perfect time to become an Andrew. Yes, an inviter. So if you would please take this moment to invite your friends, your family, your loved ones, both near and far, to join in this worship service. Allow them to come into the room. We're streaming live right now on SSC Live TV, YouTube, and Facebook. Again, we say welcome to the St. Stephen Baptist Church service. We are so grateful for you. May God bless you abundantly as we continue to strive for that new transition in a new day in a new way. Remember, God loves you and so does the St. Stephen family. Good afternoon, or good morning, I do apologize. Good morning, St. Stephen. Thank you so much for joining and for your presence here today. It's giving time in the Lord's house and it's giving time in your house. We often say that you can't beat God giving. And that statement is so true, but we gotta be careful with that because God does not want a transactional relationship. God wants your whole heart. And giving should be a matter of the heart. Giving should never be hard. It should be a heart thing. And so what we know was over the past 17 months, we didn't even know what this thing was gonna do. When COVID hit, every church in America and beyond were looking and trying to understand how is this going to be? How are we gonna gather again? But the thing that I love about my God is that Romans 8 reminds us, and we know that all things work together even when we don't know how it's going to work out god has already figured it out god is so god that he will take what the enemy meant for your bad and he will start turning that thing for your good so when we talk about you can't beat god giving you can't beat god giving you a restful night to sleep you can't beat God keeping his arms around your children when they're away from you. You can't beat God for giving you a reasonable portion of your health and strength. You can't beat God giving you a sound mind and the ability of your limbs. You can't beat God giving. So it should be a matter of the heart. Not a hard thing, but a heart thing. Also remember, if you have not placed your offertory into the bins that are in the rear of the church, please make certain that you do that before you leave. Um, as we have, we won't be walking around like we usually do. We have bins that are in the rear of the church for you to deposit those offerings and tithes. And we thank you so much. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, God, for covering us and keeping us, God. We know, Father, that if it's not you, if you're not in it, it's not going to work. So we ask, God, that you would bless the offering and the tithe that would be used for the advancement of your kingdom's agenda. Father, we're asking that you would bless the giver and the gift. Bless those who have it and those who don't. But then, Father, we're also asking, Lord, that you would bless those who have it and don't even want to give. We're asking, Lord, that you would cover each and every one of us, God, because the word reminds us when we were enemies with you, you still loved us. So, God, we thank you. We praise you. We adore you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We thank you in advance for your giving. Because it's your generosity and faithfulness in giving that allows us to continue to spread the gospel and serve as a lighthouse. Here are ways to give at St. Stephen Baptist Church. You can mail in your gifts 
Mail your tithes and offering to St. Stephen Baptist Church, 1018 South 15th Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40210. Make it to the attention of our trustee's office. You can give via our app. Be sure to download the St. Stephen Baptist Church app from the Apple Store or the Google Play Store. You can give online by visiting ssclive.org and click Give. You can give via Cash App. Our cash tag is dollar sign SSC Live One. That's dollar sign SSC Live One. Be sure to add your name, email, or phone number in the memo line so you can get credit for your giving. You can also text to give. Text the amount to the keyword SSC Live to 833-602-0575. That's 833-602-0575. Thank you in advance for your obedience, for your generosity, and for taking care of the house. Now let's return to worship.
pray for 40 minutes out there, you open up your mouth and begin magnifying the God of your salvation. Thank God for your peace. Thank God for your peace. Thank God for your peace. Peace in our homes. Peace when we're sick. Peace on our jobs. Peace in when we don't know what to do. When things are just not turning around for us. God's hand is at work. You want to open up your mouth and thank God for his peace. You want to open up your mouth and thank God for the peace of the Lord. Thank you so much. Oh. My God. Come on, let's give some love. They've been standing on their feet, ministering to them. Let's refresh them. Come on. If you're online, give them some likes right now. My God. My God. Praise be to God from whom all blessings. God bless you. Thank you so very much. Amen. Praise be to God for peace. And that's what our world needs. You will not have peace horizontally with each other if you don't first have peace vertically with God. Praise be to God for peace. And the wonderful thing about the peace of God that passes all understanding is that you can have peace in the middle of a storm. In the middle of a storm, when your boat is rocking, Jesus can stand up in the midst of your situation and he can say, peace. And he can say, be still. And the winds and the waves shall obey his will. To God be the glory. Thank you for being with us today. We are transitioning back to on-campus worship. If someone were to ask me, if I were to write a book about our experience, I already know what I would entitle the book about what we have learned and grown into during the COVID-19 period, what St. Stephen Church has learned to perfect. I would entitle the book the bifocal church. Because when you wear bifocals, you have to see it. They help you to see up close and they help you to see at a distance. And we're doing bifocal ministry up close on campus, distance online from people all around the world, which reflects our evangelistic strategy. Jesus wanted us to be bifocal, so he said, and you shall receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. That's up close. Samaria, that's a little bit further. But then he says, to the uttermost parts of the earth. 
and that is uh, what we're doing uh, here at St. Stephen Church, and we'll continue to do through technology. Praise be to God that we can use the tools of our culture to reach our culture. Happy 4th of July. I want to thank um, the most brilliant, most elegant uh, Miss Benny Baye for her contribution and helping us understand our pilgrimage in America. Don't get it wrong. No one, no group, no demographic has been more loyal to these United Hates, I mean states of America, as black descendants of enslaved Jim Crow, Jane Crow people. We have fought in every war. As Benny Baye said, Crispus Attucks was the first person, person period, to die in a, for a revolution that his people were excluded from. Constitution said that black people were three-fifths of a person, and that was reinforced in 1857 with the Plessy versus, no, excuse me, the James, the Tanny Dred Scott case, in which they said, Judge Tanny said that black people in 1857 have no rights that white people are bound to respect. Now, you comprehend that. That means if I want to sell your child away, I can do it. If I want to beat you, I can do it. If I want to plunder your wealth, I can do it. If I want to um, cut off limbs, you have no rights that I am bound to respect. But yet in spite of that, we have fought in every war. Now listen to this. We have never fought against America. Japanese fought, Japanese Americans, Japanese fought against America. Um, uh, the Spanish American War. Spain fought against America. Um, the British fought against America. Italian Mussolini fought against America. Germans fought against America. But black people have never fought against the country who brutalized us. James Baldwin called this country, and, he, and Betty alluded to it, moral monsters. As it relates to us, this country has been a moral monster. But yet God has kept us. That's the miracle. God has sustained us. Amen. So we have reason to celebrate 4th of July because there would be no America if it were not for us. But before we look at God's word together, the Bible says, Jesus said, now this, I'll, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And that should not only be God's house, but that should also be your house. So you should keep a prayer list, the people that you're praying for. And um, we're going to um, look at some of the names on our church's prayer list, and then we're going to pray for them. And then I'm going to invite you to take out your own prayer list. And every time we come to worship, bring your prayer list with you. In fact, bring your bills. We're going to pray about your bills. Bring the bad medical report, whatever it is. Trouble, whatever's troubling you, trouble God with what's troubling you in prayer. So on our Hardin County campus, happy birthday to Anastasia Cummings and Tracy Smith. Happy birthday to you. Shout out to faithful members, Vicki Phillips and Joy Green Gray. We love you. Southern Indiana campus, a special shout out to the peerless Deacon Dale Ballard and the phenomenal, I mean phenomenal, brother Deacon T.A. Spalding. What a great brother. Deacon Letty Panwell. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Letty. And also on our Louisville campus, Reverend Pat Taylor. Please be in prayer. Pat's sister, Pamela Jean Dickerson, in an unexpected way, transitioned. So Reverend Pat Taylor means so much to us. We love the family. 
Pat, we are praying for you. Prayers for Annetta Carter and family and the recent loss of her brother. Monique Bell asks for prayer as she makes career changes in her life and for her family. Monique, we're praying for you. Prayers for the Kearns family and the loss of Ann Kearns, who was the former JCPS teacher. Prayer for Julie Dyson and family in the recent loss of her brother, Kenneth. Let us continue to pray for Gladys Buckner. She's a friend of our family, a wonderful member of our church who recently went the surgery, and she's doing very well. We thank God for the good report. Happy birthday to Cynthia Morgan, Penny Johnson, the wonderful Miss Pam Barker. She knows she's bad. To Michael Cutter, uh, Cutter, Rachel Smith, my man, the nicest man and the meanest man at the same time. He's the greatest friend, but he don't play. And that is Martin McCoy. He's going to get me for that one. He goes, okay, Pastor. But we love you, Mark. We appreciate you so much. I want to say happy birthday to you, my friend. To, uh, Tasha Dansby. Dansby Gobenside, happy birthday. Sister Hope Blackwell, who's a personification of her name. Hope is a woman of hope. Playing, praying for you, happy birthday. And Janine Lynette, happy birthday. Happy anniversary to Deacon and Andre and Tony Woods. My God, it seems like it was just yesterday that they got married. Amen. I'll never forget Tony's encouragement to me when my daughter Christine was sick. God bless you. That's why we exist. We exist. Don't always lift others. You climb. Make sure you climb as high as you can, but, but lift while you are climbing. Amen. Lift while you're climbing. And then our e-campus from St. Louis, Missouri, I told your bifocals up close and distance. Our St. Louis member, Alina Harris, excuse me, Diamond Williams from St. Louis, and also locally, Alina Harris, Louisville, Kentucky. That's those on our prayer list, and um, you should have your own prayer list at home uh, because there's power in prayer. So bring your prayer list out, let's pray. And while you have people on your prayer list, don't forget to put yourself on the prayer list. Pray for everybody, but pray for yourself. Forgive everybody, forgive yourself, love everybody, love yourself. Be kind to everybody, but by all means, be kind to yourself. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls us from a world of care and bids us at our Father's throne, makes all our wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and often escaped the tempter's snare. By thy return, sweet hour of prayer. And from Mount Pisgah's lofty heights, I view my home and see my flight and cry while shouting in the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. And it is a sweet hour of prayer. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, oh, God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Some of the names that we have mentioned have been mentioned because of a burden, the burden of grief, the burden of stress, the burden of transitions and making decisions. Some are because of a burden and some because of a blessing, a milestone like a birthday or a milestone like a wedding anniversary. And it is only fitting, Lord, that we mention burdens because sometimes that's what we're experiencing but don't let us be so burden focused that we forget that we also have blessings and we thank you because if we were to put our blessings on one side of the scale and our burdens on the other side of the scale we thank you that our blessings outweigh our burdens so for every name that has been mentioned on our prayer list and for every person who is online, wherever they may be, who has a bill
that they have to pay or a decision they have to make or somebody that they must have the courage to confront and tell the truth to or someone, oh God, who has been in denial about an issue in their life but they are coming to grips with the fact that they won't fix it if they don't face it. Whoever the person may be, be they in this room, on campus, or in their home online, thank you that in your omniscience and omnipresence that you hear all prayers. Regardless of where we may be, you hear all prayers. You incline your heart to us. And thank you that even when we were not praying, you didn't stop blessing. Even when our prayers have been inconsistent, you have been consistently good to us. You have put a hedge of protection around us. You've looked beyond our faults and you have supplied our needs. We thank you that uh, uh, the hearse didn't pull up into our driveway during COVID-19 and take our bodies to some mortuary. But you, you, you had angels all night and all day. Angels, angels, your invisible agents of love. Angels, they keep a watching over us. And we say thank you. If we haven't said thank you, Lord, it's because we haven't been thoughtful. So we say thank you. Thank you not only what you've done for us, but thank you what you've done for our families. Thank you that our children are okay. Oh God, you have been good to us. Oh, bless your people. Bless your people right now. Bless your people right now. Bless your people. We need your blessings. We need your favor. Hallelujah. And we praise you in advance because the bill has been paid. We praise you in advance because we'll get up out of that sick bed. We praise you in advance because everything's going to be all right. We praise you in advance because we will get through what life did not let us get around. We praise you in advance. We praise you in advance because of someone had told us that we were going to have to go through what we have gone through. We would have sworn we would never have made it. But we went through it. And by your grace, we've made it. We feel better because we had a talk with you. Calm our hearts and settle our spirits. You've always been there. In Jesus' name, amen. I thank you so much for joining us today in worship, and we want to encourage you to right now to contact somebody and invite them to tune in to SSC Live TV. This is the 4th of July. Miss Betty Baye talked about Frederick Douglass's classic speech. I hope you'll Google that. He gave it to a group of women, a women's group, a group of feminists, and um, Many feminists, white feminists, white women, prior to the beginning of the Civil War, especially during the 1850s, which was the worst decade for blacks in American history. The worst, the worst decade was 1850 to 1960. 1860, excuse me, 1860, period, because of the fugitive slave laws. And when Frederick Douglass gave that classic speech about what is the 4th of July to the slave, he said, I will give it. He told these feminists, I'll give the speech on the condition that I don't give it on July the 4th. He said, I'm only going to give it in protest. He gave it on July the 5th. He said, because we have no right to celebrate on the 4th. And he was not only talking about the enslaved, but he was talking about the enslavers, the planters, the country, because America is not about freedom and liberty. So we should just cross out July the 4th 
and just, he said, we'll do it on July the 5th, and that's when he gave the speech. Uh, the, our praise and worship team and Brother Jarrell, my God, didn't he sing that song? Wow. Talked about peace on earth. And um, that's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about no justice, no peace. And that phrase, you, we use it now, it's part of woke culture. No justice, no peace was coined by the Reverend Al Sharpton. No justice, no peace. I have a niece named Letitia, and I've added something to it. I said, no justice, no peace. Letitia's my niece. The BS must cease. <laughs> so no justice, no peace. I want you to share with me some two stories that are part of the same coin, but the flip side of the same coin because they communicate the same message. They reinforce the same message. It's like a parallels on a track, like a track has two rails. And these two parables are like the two rails in which the train of justice can flow through. They're stories Jesus told. And if you look at them carefully, uh, you can see that these are stories about justice that speak to our issues today. And we do have issues, and we have always had issues in this country. And fundamentally, all issues in America center around race. All issues center around race. Now, all other issues are secondary, are, are, um, are the consequence of us not getting race right. It's just like if I button my shirt, and I've told you this before, if the first button is in the wrong hole, then the second button is in the wrong hole, and the third button is in the wrong hole. If you pull in a parking lot and you're next to somebody who... Uh, is straddling the lines in the parking lot, then you will straddle the line when you pull in next to them, and the car next to you will straddle the line and the car next to them because we got the first thing wrong. And the first thing we got wrong was this issue of the dehumanization of black people, slavery. We got it wrong, and we have never gotten this thing right. And so we don't have peace in our world. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verse 6, Jesus tells a story. He says, um, excuse me, beginning with verse 5. Then Jesus teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked. Don't forget that. The door is locked. And for so many, that has been the experience of black America, locked doors. The door is locked for the night, and my family and I are all in bed I can't help you. No, you got it wrong, brother. It's not that you can't. You won't. I won't help you. Just go ahead and be honest. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for his friendship's sake, if he keeps on knocking long enough, if he keeps messing with this guy's peace long enough, he will get up, he will get woke, and give up whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And then in Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells uh, another parable, which is the flip side of this story. 
And it's a parable about a woman, and she's experiencing the same thing. It says, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. That's the Donald Trump verse of the Bible. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dis dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while. But finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people. But this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's worrying me out with her constant requests. The Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust, unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Jesus didn't speak much about hell. When we were younger, we, we, we had a whole lot of um, sermons on hell. That was one of the ways they incentivized you to join church. But what's interesting is that Jesus did not speak much about hell. In fact, he only mentioned hell twice. He mentioned hell when he talks about the story of a rich man. We call dives. The word, the, the word rich, the Latin word for rich is dives. So we just call this rich man dives. And it says there was a rich man, dives, who dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate, was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died. And, and by the way, the, the, the name Lazarus literally means God takes care of. So the beggar died and angels came, carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died, knows the difference in verse 22, and was buried, which means that if he was buried, that means the rich man had a funeral. We don't read in verse 22 that the beggar had a funeral. It just says he died, and then the angels came again. So what probably happened was he was living on the streets anyway. He was begging for the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. The dogs were licking his sores, so he was out on the streets. And he died on the streets, and the angels came and got him. The rich man died. He was buried, which means they picked up his body. They had a funeral. They celebrated him. But notice it says, in hell, where he, the rich man, was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus stopped by his side. So that's one of the times when Jesus spoke about hell. The rich man, Davies, who fared sumptuously every day, he went to hell. And then the second time Jesus talked about hell is when he talks about the parable of the sheep and the goats. He says, in the last day, you know the story, God will separate the goats from the sheep. He will say to the sheep, come and be with me on my right side. And then he will say to the goats, depart from me. You're cursed into the eternal fire. And the question is, what was the criteria? What, what standard did Jesus saying God would use in the judgment to determine who's a goat, who's a sheep, who goes on the right side, who goes on the left side. Goats on the left, sheep on the right. And this is what Jesus says. 
He says, for I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. I was an immigrant. And you put me in cages. You did not invite me in. I needed clothes. And you, you, you divies, wore purple every day. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick. You did not provide me with health care. I was in prison and you didn't push for prison reform. And that's why you are condemned. Now these two stories of two people going to hell point to the same reality from the perspective of Jesus. And that was, first of all, there was a, a wide economic gulf between the poor and the rich. There was a poor man who lived on the street. There was a rich man who fared sumptuously every day. And all the poor man wanted was not the whole loaf, but just the crumbs that fell from his table. And what he was really saying was the napkins. Because in those days, they would wipe their face not with a napkin or cloth. They, when they eat, they would wipe their face with old bread. And then they would throw the bread outside the window. And that's why the dogs were out there. Because all this man wanted was he was so desperate that all he wanted was to get the napkins that we wipe our faith with so he could just pick through the napkins and find something to eat. And there's a gap. And then Jesus says that in the last judgment, here's the criteria. He doesn't say anything about sexual orientation. He doesn't say about anything about where you're going to hell because you smoke weed. That's white, conservative, evangelical eisegesis interjecting into the text their worldview instead of pulling out of the text, exegeting from the text what the text actually says. There's a great gulf between people, the haves and the have-nots. And the reason why those who end up in hell, Davies and the goats, is because while there's a gulf, they did nothing to close the gap. They did nothing to close the gulf. They did, did nothing to write what the Bible calls injustice. It's all about justice, which is a major theme in the Bible, justice. I have in my library two Bibles. I highly recommend them. One is called the Justice Bible. The Justice Bible, it's an NIV Bible. And another one's called the Poverty Justice Bible. And it, it highlights all of the passages in the Bible that talk about justice. And it is a theme that is prominent. It's not a marginal theme. It is a central theme in Scripture that God is a God of justice. What is justice? Justice is simply righting wrongs. It's wrong for there to be a man out there with the dogs um, wanting to eat the crumbs that are in someone's napkins. Anytime society has been so organized and arranged like that, that does not reflect God. That's wrong. When Jesus said, pray, give us this day our daily bread, the key is the plural pronouns. Not give me bread. Not give me this day some bread to eat. But give us. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and once say, I. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and once say, my. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and not pray for your brother. 
For when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you must include another. Because it's us, give us this day. Lead us, not in temptation. Deliver us, us, not just me, not just one community. The usness, our, not your father, as though God, you have a monopoly on God's love. But our father, God so loved the world. God is concerned with justice. Moses said in the book of Deuteronomy, which is the justice book of the Old Testament, he says in Deuteronomy 16, 19, and you can always remember this verse because we came to North America, the British colony, Angela, in, in 1619. So there's something called, you know, Nicole Hannah Jones wrote the 1619 Project. So you can remember this verse. Just remember 1619. Deuteronomy 1619 says, Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the, of the wise and twists the words of the righteous, verse 20. And that's when the Mayflower came in 1620. Follow justice, justice alone, so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. Follow justice. And what is justice? What does it mean for Christians to follow justice, which is the reason our world is so messed up, the reason why this year in my city of Louisville, I don't know about what city you may be watching from, but in my city of Louisville, we've had a record number of homicides. First part of this year, 100 homicides. And the root cause is that our nation, our community, our city, our state has not pursued justice. And this is what these two parables about are about. This man who knocks at his neighbor's door at midnight. And this woman who is following this judge, saying, give me justice, this circular judge who fears neither God nor man, he's a circular judge, which means in, he goes from one community to another community to adjudicate uh, uh, court decisions, grievances. And every community this judge goes to, this widow woman follows him and says, no justice, no peace. And here's a man who knocks on someone's door. It's midnight. He has, a, he has a friend who comes to his house unexpected at midnight. And that's what it means to be poor. You never know what you're going to expect. When you've got wealth, you can deal with the unseen things, the unexpected things, but to be poor. You never know when your child's going to break their glasses. And you got to go to the optometrist and, can, can I just put $10 a month for, on this? That might not seem like much to you, but if you're Lazarus and you're trying to eat crumbs from the, ta from the table of the rich man, it does. And God is a God of justice. And this man who has... His friend come at midnight. He knows he doesn't have the bread to feed him. So he goes to his neighbor's house who has bread. And he only goes to that neighbor's house because he knows he has it. And he goes at midnight. He's unashamed. And he knocks on the door seeking bread. And please note, that he's seeking bread for someone else. If his neighbor had not come, he never would have been out there knocking, which, which brings up an important point, and that is if you bless someone else, if it's not always about you, if you go knocking for somebody else, I, I know you got it made. I know you got the good job. I know you drive the nice car. I know you got your golden parachute, but something about when you're in a position, when you're okay, you go knocking for somebody else. 
That is the epitome of what it means to be a Christian. When you're knocking, this man is not knocking for himself. He's knocking for someone else. And he wants justice. And he wants a particular type of justice. And I want you to know what that particular type of justice he wants. He wants what's called, and please fill this in your message notes, he wants re redistributive justice. He wants redistributive justice. Somebody's got bread, he doesn't have bread, he wants the bread to be redistributed, which is biblical, biblical. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. We always quote John 3.16, but why don't we quote 1 John 3.16? 1 John 3.16, don't forget that. You know John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But 1 John 3.16 talks about how we're supposed to love each other. It says we know what real love is. Both John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16 talk about love, but one's talking about vertical, the other's talking about horizontal. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well, and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? James chapter 2, verse 4 through 17 says this. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, Dear friends, do you think you would get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags, half starved, and say, good morning, friend, be clothed in Christ. You know how we talk Christianese, <laughs> our Christian ghetto language at Christianese, hallelujah, be clothed in Christ. Hallelujah, be filled with the Holy Ghost. And after all saying all of these words, you walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? And then Micah 6 and 8 says this. This is important. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to act justly to love mercy, park here with me, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Notice he talks about, I want you to be merciful, but I want you to be just. And he talks about justice first. He, he, the sequence is important. He says, act justly and love mercy. Why? Because if we do justice right, we don't have to do mercy. See, mercy, fill in the blank, is acting compassionately towards the person on a personal level. So, uh, so this past week when I was pumping gas downtown, uh, it was on 2nd Street, and there was some man whose hair was disheveled, street person, out of his mind, brother, brother. And it's, he, he, he was so deranged that his nakedness, his lack of shame, he didn't care. His pants were down, no, no underwear. You could see his private parts. And he was coming from car to car asking for money. And he came to my car and I gave him something. I gave him something. That, that's an act of mercy. I pull in a store on 28th and Market, and there's a f man trying to get some gas in his car, old car, white man. And in his, I was going to get a newspaper because my picture was in it. <laughs> God took the focus off of me and said, look over there. And there in the car was a white family. 
And a man, and I'll never forget it, his wife and three kids and an old woman. And the merciful thing to do was God said, God will touch your heart if you're open to God. God said, take what's in your wallet and give it to them. And you could tell they've been sleeping in the car. They had food in the car and blankets in the car. And I said, I knocked on his window, and, and it's in Portland, and he's a little startled because here's a black man knocking on his window. And he rolls down his window like, oh, yeah. And I said, here, man, you take this. And he just held his arms up. And I will never forget to the day I die how that emaciated, thin grandmother of a woman raised up from her seat in the back seat with tears in her eyes and said, thank you. And the reason I did it is because I've been there. And the reason you ought to be merciful is because you've been there. And even if you haven't been there, you never know where you might be. And you never know who's going to have to wipe your behind. <laughs> but that's mercy. And we should. That's, on a, that's something I did on a personal level. The problem with all these white evangelical churches is they love to do mercy. And they love to do it because it makes them feel good. It makes them feel superior because I helped you. Justice says you shouldn't be in a position to help me because I'm now able to help myself. See, justice, fill in the blank. Here's what justice is. Justice is eliminating, eliminating public policies that made them poor in the first place. So if you eliminate the, if you, if you have good policies, nobody will be poor in the First place. See, the, the, in, in our country, when it comes, especially when it comes to black poverty, you, you basically have four reasons that will be given why black people are poor. And we are poor. We are the poorest expression of blackness in the country. Blackness is being expanded. You got Caribbeans. West Africans, foundational black Americans, American descendants of slavery, indigenous black people who trace their lineage back to slavery. I trace my lineage back to Alabama, northern Alabama. And, when, and, and we are the poorest expression of it. We are. We're, we're at the bottom of the bottom, black people. I know you see the athletes. I know you see the entertainers, but they are what you call, listen to me, they're what you call outliers. You don't determine the health of a community based on the outliers. You got to look at the median. What's the median? When it comes to median wealth, and it's all about wealth. Wealth is what you own, what you, what you own, what you control, and what you can pass down to your family. That's your wealth. I got a house. It's paid for. I pass that down to my kids. Barnett and I got a little, just a little money in the bank. That's wealth. Pass that down to your kids. You want something you own, you own, you, own, you control, and you pass down. That is wealth. And by 2053, and with COVID, that's what they were projecting. That was the prognostications prior to COVID. It's probably sooner now they're projected by 2053, black people will have zero wealth. We who created wealth for this country, we whose sweat built America, don't have wealth. And then when you start asking, that's why you got to be woke. And you start hearing the reasons and the explanations that, uh, why we don't have wealth, they'll give you either it's fate, God ordained it. God ain't had nothing to do with this. Or uh, they'll, they'll subscribe to Charles Mary un, under the bell curve, and that is failure. 
You just are innately inferior. Or they will say it's your fault. It's the choices you make. Listen, the reason why kids ask in West Louisville is not because of the choices they make, it's because of the choices they have. Or it's fault. But here's the reasons, fairness. Fairness. You want to end crime tomorrow, white evangelical Christians, Franklin Graham? You want to end it tomorrow? They do justice. We hate crime. We hate crime. But we don't hate the conditions that produce it, the, the root causes. For example, you want to end crime in, in West Louisville? Do this. Reverse Trump's tax breaks to the rich. Pass a guarantee jobs bill like they had in the 30s where people are able to get a living wage like they did in the 30s. See, it's interesting that everybody gets the bailout but us. Everybody gets monetized. We get ghettoized. They get monetized. So, so, so when, when COVID hit, they said, oh, we got to pass a, a, a multi-trillion dollar rescue plan. Well, black folks should have been rescued a long time ago. Yeah. Get people living wage. You want, you want to fix this? Uh, provide universal single-payer health care. Single payer, payer means single payer health care means that it comes from one source, namely the federal government. Protect voting rights. They're trying to suppress our vote because there's power in our vote. We get to we get decision making. This is this is all this has to do with fairness, baby. It had nothing to do with I'm gonna send you a track. Let me come and witness to you. Or as the former governor, what was his name, uh, said, what we need to do is we need to go down to West Louisville and just have prayer time on the corners. I said, please. <laughs> we got churches on every corner. Folk, black folk been praying for 500 years. <laughs> Criminal justice reform. You're right. Equitable funding in our public schools. You want, you want to, fairness, cancel student loan debt. And let every child in this rich, the richest country in the history of the world, which is also the greatest, Davies, goat country. We're goats. We're Davies. Uh, cancel student loan debt, let all kids go to college free and, and, and give me some reparations. Yeah. Pay me. Yeah. And that's what, that's what this widow, this woman, and this widow woman was talking about. See, the man at midnight was wanting redistributive, redistributive justice is nobody should have all the bread. So that's what, redistribute the bread. This woman was looking for another kind of justice. This sister was looking for reparative justice. And reparative justice is when someone or a system has damaged you. And you want the system to fix what the system broke. And this woman was damaged by the system. System. She's a widow woman who somebody stole from her, and Jesus alluded to who it was who did it. In Luke chapter 20, verse 46 and 47, he says, Beware of these teachers of the religious laws. It's the system, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces. And how they love the seats of honor in the synagogue and the head table at banquets. Yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property. This woman had been cheated out of her property. And uh, she wanted, she wanted 
to be repaired. She was going to the system to have it repaired. James Gall Jr., brilliant, in his book uh, on James Baldwin, our men read this book. In fact, Eddie Gall did a special uh, special podcast just with our men after reading the book. Eddie Glaw, brilliant. He says, the United States is in a bitter battle over American history and how we ought to publicly remember the past. That's what's going on in our school systems. This whole debate about critical race theory and excluding our history. We don't want to talk about how we've been damaged. The reason we're poor, this woman's poor because she was damaged. The reason black folk don't have any wealth, we don't have any wealth. You think you have wealth. Even if you got a car, if you're paying on it, you got negative wealth because it ain't yours. And if you got a house and it's not paid for, you got negative wealth. Wealth is what you own, what you control, and what you can pass down to your children. We don't have nothing but to pass down but some funeral bills. We ain't passed any wealth down. I mean, the reason why I don't have any wealth because our wealth has been plundered through injustice. Let me give it to you. Reparations means image. Got to repair our image. They've lied on us. They think we are buffoons. They, we've been depicted as non-intellectuals, non-thinkers, non-leaders. I know what I'm talking about because I'm a president of a college and I got to deal with this constantly because I dared to move outside the realm of the ecclesiastical and got into the scholastic and became a college, the first black college president of a private college accredited in the history of the state of Kentucky and I got pushed back and still get pushed back because as long as I stay in my place and don't get up at it. You're all right now just being a preacher in the West Louisville, but don't, don't, don't come up here competing with me like you avail at UK or, 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 or Spalding or any of these other schools because the image is you don't have the intellect to do it. That's our image. That's a damn lie. You just have not had the chance. And then the narrative, reparations mean, get the narrative right. The narrative means they, they don't tell the story. It's what's called the spotlight effect. You know what a spotlight is? A spotlight, if you put a spotlight, that's a spotlight. That's a stage. It's a big, big stage. I guarantee you it's a big stage. But what do you see? Only what is being spotlighted. And guess what happens in our schools? The spotlight effect. So they focus our attention on what they want to see in order to glamorize and romanticize them. them. And that's why, you know, I didn't know there was a black Wall Street. They never talked to me about Tulsa and black Wall Street. It's not because it wasn't on the stage. It just didn't get the spotlight. I wish I had somebody. It didn't get the spotlight. And what's going on in JCPS? When you have these modern day, and I'm going to tell you who gave me this, boys, modern day white citizens council is trying to keep the spotlight off of America's dirt. But America did. And and the the tragedy is not that it's just white folk, but it's some of you coon Negroes (laughs) who don't want the spotlight. Talking about reparations. You got to repair me because you messed up my image. You got to repair me because you lied about the narrative. You got to repair me because of Jim Crow. Jim and Jane Crow, you got excluded. My daddy could not go to you avail because he was black and they had a law that excluded him that's Jim Crow which means he got held back which means he couldn't pass anything on to me urban renewal why is there a Ninth Street divide that is a part of the system that is not accidental urban renewal it's called Negro removal in which they destroyed all of our businesses and all of our companies and deprived us of wealth. Hallelujah. S, slavery. 
slavery. You walked 246 years and didn't get a paycheck. You didn't get your 15 acres and a mule. They rescinded uh, field order number 15. They rescinded it. Slavery, terrorism, which means lynching. You got lynched to, be, to stay in your place. That's why Ida B. Wells rose up, talked about us getting lynched like Mary Turner in Valdosta, Georgia. 19-year-old pregnant woman. And they lynch her husband, and she's trying to defend her husband, and they take her, and they tie her up and turn her upside down and set her on fire and take a knife and cut open her abdomen. And when the baby comes out crying, uh, one of the lynchers took his heel and killed the baby. They didn't tell you that, did they? That's why they don't want you to know about critical race theory because you got a justice claim. Incarceration. Black males are 7%, 6% of the population, 42% of those on death row, almost 50% of those in jail. Mass incarceration, cops and courts. They can break into your house and shoot you down with impunity. And let me tell you, let me tell you why Brianna got shot. She got shot because she was in the wrong neighborhood. They would not do that in other neighborhoods. Cops and courts and exclusion. Exclusion, being totally excluded. And guess what? We want to act like we now are a colorblind society. We are not colorblind. We're history blind. And history blind makes you justice blind. And that's why you got to know your story. Here's a man who wants redistributive justice. Here's a woman who wants reparative justice. And and they say, no justice, no peace, because I'm going to keep knocking at your door. I'm going to wake up your animals and in your house. I'm going to wake up your kids. And this judge, I'm going to keep following you. I don't care what city you go to. I'm going to follow you. And they keep on going, seeking justice, seeking to get a wrong, right it, which we have been trying to do for 500 years. That is our story. This, these scriptures are our story. But notice the response. Notice the response. They, they, they make the request, give me justice, give me some bread. Tell judge, tell those the people who took my house, I'm a widow woman, to repair me. And, and, and the response is resistance. Resistance. Martin Luther King said in his letter from a Birmingham jail that we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Justice too long delayed is justice Denied. God never intended, hear me, God never intended that there be poor people. Never. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 4 through 6 says, no one in Israel should ever be poor. No one in America should ever be poor. The Lord your God has given you this land, and he has promised to make you very successful if you obey his laws and teachings that I'm giving you today. You will lend money to many nations. You won't have to borrow. You will rule many nations, but they won't rule you. Stop here. No, God never intended for them to be poor. Then why are they poor? Why is there poverty? He tells us in the same chapter, verse 11. He says, there will always be some Israelites who are poor and needy. That is why I'm commending you to be generous. The reason why people are poor is because we're tight-fisted. We are greedy. We hoard. We don't pass the blessings. We don't have public policies of equity. And you come to church. That's why these folk are atheists. That's why these young folk don't want to come to church. That's why they want to hear none of this crap. They can read the Bible. They can see what God said do. And we go to church and say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. And no justice. So one, 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 one man is... He's knocking on the door, and, and the man on the inside, door's locked. That's, that's what well, it is to be black. Door's locked. He said, look, it's too late. It's, lo- it's too late. And he tries to explain it away. 
I'm asleep, my family sleep, the animals are in the house, you're going to wake them up. The woman is being ignored, the judge just ignores her. She said, no justice, no peace, judge. And he just says, let's keep on with the proceedings. So you see, don't you, the request, give me justice. You see the response ignored. But look at the requirements. The end of the story is this. They get justice. The man gets his bread. He walks out of three loaves of bread. That woman gets her house back. But they had to be willing to do something. And here's the requirement. Frederick Douglass said that power concedes nothing except by demand. It never has, it never will. Let me quote Frederick Douglass again. He said, power concedes nothing except by demand. It never shall, it never will. They're not going to just make room for you on the front of the bus, Rosa. You got to demand it. They're not just going to give you the ballot, John Lewis. You got to demand it. And you got, which means you got to put pressure on the system because listen to me Yvette Carnell is right the system and politics does not re they respond to pressure and not applause the system only responds to pressure you gotta put pressure the man at midnight what did he keep doing he kept on knocking open the door I need some bread open the door open it go away no open the door open the door and the woman kept on following the judge and she, 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 the judge says, in fact, in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 18, the judge ignored her for a while, but finally said to himself, I don't fear God, and because I'm saved, and I don't give a daggone about her. But this woman's driving me crazy. And I'm going to see that she gets justice because they're driving us crazy. They, they, they're, they are downtown Louisville in the streets. Driving us crazy. They're, they are, we got to board up our businesses. It's messing with our money. They are driving. It's not because they like you. You didn't get voting rights because they like you. You didn't get free from slavery. But you don't have to like me. I don't need you to like me. I like myself. Barnetta likes me. I don't need you to like me. I want you to pay me. I want you to give me what's mine. I want you to give me what's mine. And don't you think that just because you work for the man. See, the arrangement is domination, subordination. Domination, subordination. Domination, subordination. Domination, subordination. Domination, subordination. So they'll tell you, go get your degree in journalism and you work hard to get your degree in journalism so you can work in a white dominated industry oh they'll tell uh, uh, Nicole Hannah Smith go get your credentials girl win your Pulitzer so you can go to North Carolina meet all the criteria, criteria for tenure but they still get to call the shots. You still dominate it. You get your law degree only to have to go to some white firm that you don't control. You get your medical degree only to go work for somebody else because it's, I don't mind you getting your stuff as long as I'm on top. And the paradigm has got to shift where instead of us always being subordinate, that's why I'm at Simmons, because I want something I can control. That's why I'm at St. Stephen, because I want something that we can control. And don't go for the okey-doke, because they're going to try to give you some okey-doke. What I mean? They wanted, what did that man want? He wanted bread. What did that woman want? She wanted house. 
What do you want? You ought to have some money in your pocket. And it's old you. But they'll give you up the okie doke. They'll do the three car molly on you. Y'all ain't hearing me. They'll use a whole lot of decoys to bleep, do the car trick on you. You ain't gonna do it on you. Symbolism. They'll give you symbolism instead of justice. They'll, they'll say, okay, we're gonna put Harry Tubman's name picture on a $20 bill. I don't care who you put. Put the $20 bill in my pocket. Symbolism. Don't think you've arrived because of symbolism. They're going to okie doke you. Don't think you arrived because of holidays. Well, we gave you Juneteenth. But you're broke. Keep your holiday. And we need these holidays. We need memorials and holidays. What's wrong with Louisville? There's no black, really, memorials. No black statues. They got rid of Jefferson Davis. Thank God the governor did that in the Capitol. Put another Davis in there now. They should, a woman, Georgia Davis. Get rid of Je Je Jefferson Davis, who was on the wrong side of the Civil War, and put uh, Georgia Davis, who was on the right side of civil rights. Holidays. Don't, don't get caught up. Stay focused. Get the money. Get the bread. Get the money. Get the bread. Get the money. Get the bread. Holidays. Images. 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 Like, see, look, we, we got interracial couples on TV. See, we've arrived. That don't have nothing to do with me getting my bread. I'm voting for you, Mr. Biden, to get me some bread. This is the only criteria. Don't give me no symbols, don't give me no holidays, don't give me no images. And then don't give me no tokens. Well, you know, see, we got the first black this, first black this, first black this. And I, it's easy to remember, but I'm not going to put it on the screen because I like to use a lot of initials and acrostics and stuff like that. But, but it's, I didn't cuss. I didn't say a bad word. I didn't cuss. The only bad word I said was paradigm shift. S-H-I-F-T. Don't give me that stuff. No justice. No peace. So let me summarize it. Here it is, four quick words, I'm through. There was insistence. We insist that we get justice. And you won't get it until you insist it. There was resistance. Leave me alone, doors locked. I'm going to the next town, I'm the judge. Insist, resist, this is our experience. Insist, resist. Here it is, persist, keep on knocking, keep on following the judge. Insist, resist, persist, and here it is, assist. Jesus says, and I close, he says in Luke chapter 18, he says, I tell you in verse 8, he will grant you justice and to them quickly. Or verse 7 says, even he rendered a just decision in the end. She got her justice. So don't you think God will surely give you justice? I will assist you. You insist, they resist, you persist, I will assist. I will help you get your justice. And that has been our story, that God has helped us get our justice. Every, all justice we've gotten because God has helped us get our justice. Stolen the road we tried. Bitter the chastening rod, the chastening rod. You know what that is? The chastening rod is the whip. 
Stony the road we try, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Think about that metaphor. Hope, we never had hope. In the midst of our hopelessness, James Weldon Johnson and Rosamont Johnson, his brother, said, yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the places for which our fathers have sighed? We have come over a trail that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our blood through the path of the slaughter. Out of a gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star has cast. God has helped us get justice, and God will continue to help us to get justice. And as the choir sung, stay in the fight. Stay in the fight. And whatever fight it may be in your life, don't quit. Insist. They will resist. You persist, and God will assist. Amen. Make sure you do that. Amen. Now listen to me. Everybody needs a church home. Everybody. That's people in this room and people online. You need a church home. And right now, there's somebody on a phone here at St. Stephen Church that wants to hear from you. And I want to encourage you right now to call the number. Do it right now. 502 502- 583-6798 at extension zero. Email us. Email us. New start. You need a new start. Someone in this room needs a new start. You come if you're in the room. There are decision counselors who are making their way down. You don't have a church home. You want prayer. You come. You need prayer. Call Call for prayer. New start at sslive.org. Listen to this powerful song. Let it bless you. Let it be your anthem. I feel like going on. God bless you.
It's so interesting how today's message blended in with last week's message. Psalm 27, verse 13, where David said, I would have fainted except I had believed that I was going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It's easy to faint when you've pushed up against something. It's easy to face to faint when there's obstacles and roadblocks in your way. But keep on believing. For Paul said, let us not get weary in well-doing, for we shall reap if we faint not. Thank you for being with us today. Hope you will join us Wednesday night for Bible study. Follow me uh, this week. I'm going to do some more on justice this week uh, on um, powerful points to ponder. Don't forget new day, new way. In two weeks, we will be here on all of our campuses. Amen. All of our campuses. Amen. If um, you are in Indiana, meet me. Let's get started off. 8.30 on our Indiana campus. Let's come together in mass. We, and then if you're in Louisville, be here for the 9.30 service. And in Hardin County, be with me at uh, 11.30. If there ever was a time that we have a reason a right and a responsibility to praise God, the God who has got us through the worst pandemic, perhaps in American history, in global history, but God brought us through, got us through. Some things in life you can't go around. You can't go around, but you can get through it and get beyond it, and God has gotten us through it. So you plan, put that down on your calendar to join us, all right? Amen. Let's receive the benediction. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our indwelling comforter, keeper, and guide, be with you, be with us all, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you real good.
Be sure to check us out on all of our digital streaming platforms, Facebook, YouTube, and SSCLive.tv, so we can stay connected. And we don't want you to leave without giving an opportunity to be a giver as we push through getting out the gospel. You can utilize our push pay system. Simply text SSC Live to 833 602 0575. That's 833 602 0575. If you're watching on SSC Live.tv, all you have to do is hit the giving tab. You can also give by visiting SSCLive.org and click the giving button. St. Stephen is now using Cash App. Our cash tag is dollar sign SSCLive. And don't forget you can always mail in your tithes and offering. Address it to St. Stephen Baptist Church, 1018 South 15th Street, 40210. Don't forget to invite all of your family and your friends. And join us here every Wednesday and Sunday. At St. Stephen Church, we're connected to God, connected to people. Get connected.